So in a short while po, good afternoon again. In a short while, we'll begin with our program. So once again, thank you for bearing with us. Diyos marahay na aldaw po sa Satuya Gabos. Magandang araw sa ating lahat. Good day to all of us. Just last month, I had as an opening to and a description of the first installment of the Saisayan Lecture Series, the word Milestone. Today, I'd say it again as we launch Saisay, the first ever internationally refereed journal of Bicol history. We welcome you to the launch of Saisai, the Journal of Bicol History. I am Christiana Micaela Embate, one of the editorial assistants of Saisai, and I will be your host tonight. Dios marhay na aldaw man po sa gabos. I am Val Dominic Monit, member of Saisai Bicol's Education Committee, and I will be your on-site moderator. Today, we are joined online and on-site by members of the editorial team, the editorial board and international advisory board, as well as our contributors as we launch the first ever internationally refereed journal of Bicol history, Sai Sai. To welcome us all, here's Father Francis Tordilia, Associate Editor of Sai Sai, the Journal of Bicol History, and President of Saisai Bicol. Merry Christmas, everyone. I'm Father Francis, and I'd like to welcome all of you on this online launching of the first internationally refereed journal, Saisai, the Journal of Bicol History. I still can't believe how a friendly but passionate conversation among Bicolano friends and colleagues like Jai and Vic led to the birth of this journal on Bicol history, culture, and heritage. Well, the journal is actually just the tip of the iceberg, which is actually a growing community of enthusiasts, scholars, academics, historians, writers, who happen to have the same interests. One more common interest is to fill the vacuum of a refereed journal on Bicol history. I'd like to emphasize refereed, since most of the existing literature on Bicol is a product of um, individual but sporadic efforts. These are good ones, and these are good initiatives, but considering we live in a post-truth era where anyone can claim just about anything without the possibility of verification, things could go a bit crazy later on. Our dream is to achieve a collaborative work that is inclusive, at the same time unrelenting in upholding scholarly standards. That explains why we ask the help of nationally and internationally renowned scholars in editing our works. So what's a priest doing here discussing about history? Well, two reasons. First, let's just say I am a historian who happens to be a priest. And second, I do not officially represent the church as the president of this group. I would say unofficially, yes, I represent the church in as much as every member of our group aspires to dialogue in order to arrive at the best take of what we may commonly know as truth. Borrowing the words of the Pope Benedict XVI and St. John Paul II, this collaboration is a modern Areopagus, uh, just like that of Athens, representing the cultural center of learned people of Athens of old, where people can freely speak their minds and hearts in pursuit of the true and good. Using a more indigenous term, this is actually a virtual plaza, long before there was internet, of course, and Netflix. Plaza used to be uh, where people uh, gather to have fun and at the same time learn from one another's experience. So should anyone propose a new idea, we would all be eager to listen. Just don't forget to bring all your citations to the fore. So friends, it is an honor and a source of great joy to be part of this team in launching Sai Sai, the Journal of Bicol History. Diyos mabalos, as in Diyos ang magbanday. 
Dios mabalos po, Father Francis. To tell us more about the journal's history, vision, and future directions, may I now call on Mr. Javier Leonardo Rojeria, editor of SaiSai, the Journal of Bicol History, and co-founder and research director of SaiSai Bicol. Diyos mabalos Val for the introduction. Maray na hapon po, Saint Dugabos. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And we apologize as well for the technical difficulties earlier. And uh, we're doing a hybrid setup, so we're actually new to this um, enterprise. No? So I have a prepared speech, and this is divided into three parts, as mentioned by Val. Um, I want to talk about the brief history of the journal, and then our vision, why we're pursuing this project, and a few acknowledgments as well. The idea for an internationally refereed journal of Beagle history first came to me in April 2019, more than two and a half years ago. I first floated the idea on Facebook by posting a status update that read, how about an annual journal of Beagle history? To my surprise, it received encouraging responses from friends, colleagues, and historians as well, most notably Dr. Norman Owen, who immediately offered me a manuscript which we can include in one of our issues. As the months passed that year, the idea never left me. I used to spend my late Friday afternoons in libraries in La Salle, in Ateneo, pouring through Philippine journals and trying to find the ones after which I can model the journal I had in mind. I came across Philippine Studies, of course, Ateneo de Manila. Then there's Philippine Quarterly of Culture and Society of the University of San Carlos, and then Xavier University's Kinaadman. So these were the journals after which our journal is modeled. I studied each and every one of them and then put together in my notes and in my mind an imaginary journal for Beacle history. It became an obsession. Then around January this year, I visited St. Jude the Deus Parish here and met with our cura and historian, Father Francis Tordilla. And I brought up to him the idea of setting up a journal of Beacle history. He could not have been more supportive. We then brought it up to Victor Nierva, who proposed something bigger to form a professional organization. We gathered a few friends, colleagues, and former students and formed what is now Sai Sai Bicol with a journal as our end among many other ends in mind. We then formed the editorial team, I the editor, Father Francis the associate editor while serving as president of Sai Sai Bicol, and Vic agreed to do the designs. Ana Rodriguez and Marion Encinas, both professional editors, later joined us as manuscript editors, while Earl Hernandez, who's also here today, uh, and Cristiana Micaela Embate, one of our MCs, completed the team as our editorial assistants. Colleagues from different institutions all over the Philippines and around the world also expressed their support for the project and accepted our invitation to become members of the journal's editorial board and editorial advisory board. Sai Sai, the Journal of Eco History, however, is not an end in itself, but a means towards a greater end. It is a long-term commitment founded on the following fourfold vision. First, we aim to advance scholarship on Eco history and Philippine local history in general by providing authors an internationally refereed platform where they can publish their work in conversation with previous and current historical studies on Bicol. We also subject manuscripts to a double-blind peer review, an integral aspect of our editorial process, because for knowledge to grow and scholarship to advance, critique is necessary. Situating one's work against the existing literature is another in order to contextualize one's contribution 
to the larger body of historical knowledge. Second, we also aim to foster collaboration with historians, social scientists, and Beagle scholars all over the world and build linkages with various institutions, such as universities, churches, local government units, cultural centers, and the general public where history also belongs. Advancing scholarship on Bikul history is a daring pursuit, and that is why it is going to take more than an individual to make it happen. It takes a village. It is therefore important to us in Saisai Bicol and in Saisai, the Journal of Bicol History, that we build this community. Third, we aim to document not only the past, but also the present for posterity. Journals reflect the times, and this to my mind is its most fascinating character. They are a living archive by which the spirit of the time is recorded. Journals will then serve as primary sources in the future for those curious enough to learn more about our time. Finally, we aim to tell the stories of Bicol's past, peoples, and culture to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Sai Sai Journal is not a parochial, inward-looking, and closed-circuit journal. It is not one that is of by and for Bicolanos alone. We look to involve non-Bicolano authors in the conversation on Bicol and likewise engage non-Bicolano audiences with our content. In the process, we hope to encourage our counterpart organizations from different regions in the Philippines to pursue more studies of their own localities. And later, maybe we can explore comparative studies where regions can have dialogues with each other. This vision is perfectly captured by Saisai Bicol's catchphrase, para sa urog kararom, and might I add, kahiwas pang pagsaisai. Not only there is depth in the stories we will tell, but breadth as well. Exactly two years and eight months after I posted that status on Facebook, and nine months after we started the editorial process for the 2021 cycle, we now bring you the maiden issue of Sai Sai, the Journal of Bicol History. It opens with the Bicol Archaeological Project, which examines the lifeways and diverse indigenous responses to Spanish colonialism by investigating sites of activity in three riverine Bicol towns, Kamaligan, Bombon, and Kipayo, which is now part of Calabanga. Written by Madeline Yakal, Stephen Acabado, and a team of archaeologists, anthropologists, and members of the clergy, the report discusses the findings of three investigations in Camarino Sur between 2016 to 2019. It is joined by two critical articles on the illustrious Bishop of Cáceres, Francisco Gainza. Jethro Kalakdai's Racializing Reform, Bishop Francisco Gainza, and the Creation of the Native Clergy in the Philippines, 1863 to 1879, and my article, Francisco Gainza, and the Establishment of the Escuela Coleo de Santa Isabel, The Pursuit of Hispanization in the Diocese of Cáceres. Earlier versions of these papers were presented during the Bishop Francisco Gainza Conference at the Universidad de Santa Isabel in December 2018. Jose Eos Trinidad's research note, Reciprocity, Conflict, and Negotiation Between the Big and Little People, and Renato Pelorina's tribute to John Larkin, champion of Philippine local history, complete the issue. Finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank our editorial board members for making this dream a reality. Stephen Acabado, Kirby Alvarez, Grace Concepcion, Ross Costello, Carla Gamalinda, Fernando Santiago, Jose, o, oh sorry, Jose A. Ostridad, and Nicholas Michael C. I'm equally grateful for the members of our International Advisory Board, who not only serve as peer reviewers, but mentors of the editorial team as well. Patricio Abinales, Filomeno V. Aguilar Jr., Nicole Kuunjeng Aboitis, Most Reverend Rex Andrew Alarcon, DD, 
Fenella Canel, Greg Castilla, Richard Chu, Father Antonio De Castro, Dada Docot, Francis Navarro, Norman Owen, Renato Pelorina, Andrea Malaya Ragrajo, Pas Verdades Santos, and Stephen Henry Tatanis. I also would like to acknowledge our contributors, the BAP team, led by Madeline Yacal, uh, represented by Earl Hernandez here this afternoon, uh, Jethro Kalakdai as well. I'd like to also thank the organizing committee of the online and the on-site launch, led by the journal's editorial team and the members of Saisai Bicol, who are also here this afternoon. This litany of thanks will not be complete without thanking the Archdiocesan Shrine and Parish of St. Jude the Deus for hosting this afternoon's launch. Father Francis Tordilla, our Cura Parroco, and their dynamic social media team uh, made up of Michael Pailado, May Velasco, Sofia Dipon, and Bea Roque. It does take a village. I end my message with an invitation for everyone to subscribe to our journal. For Beagle scholars and researchers who might be watching our live broadcast right now on Facebook, please consider publishing your work with us in Saisai, the Journal of Beagle History. Like we always say, Majana po sa danay pang pakikipagsaisay. Diyos mabalos po. Saisai Journal's maiden issue opens with the Bicol Archaeological Project Research Report, which discusses the findings of the investigations in Kipayo, Kamaligan, and Bombon. It is also very opportune that the BAP comes on the quincentennial year of Magellan's arrival and the year of our pre-colonial ancestors. To tell us more about the Bicol Archaeological Project, or BAP, may I call on Ms. Madeline Yakal, member of the BAP team, and the PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Hi everyone, my name is Maddie Yakel and I am one of the co-authors for the upcoming article, The Beagle Archaeological Project, Results of the Investigations in Kipayo, Kamaligan, and Bombon Kamarina Sur 2016 to 2019, which is soon to be published in SciSci, the Journal of Beagle History. So I want to talk a little bit about what the Beagle Archaeological Project is and what you can expect in the upcoming article. The Beagle Archaeological Project, or the BAP as we call it, has been around Kamarina Sur, around Naga and surrounding cities um, since 2016. But this is the first publication that we're putting out and we're so excited to put it out um, with SciSci in their inaugural issue. And so the BAP is a collaboration between several institutions, University of California, Los Angeles, Partido State University, National Museum of the Philippines, and the Archdiocese of Caceres. Students from the US, the Philippines, and other institutions around the globe, as well as local community members, have been part of our excavation crews over the past couple of years. Um, and they've all been a part of making this research project a reality. You'll notice we have quite a few contributors to our article, including myself, Mikhail Achabari, Earl John Cito Hernandez, Adam Lauer, Robin Meyer Lori, Chin Sin Liu, Queenie La Pena, Father Don Federico, Father Eric Bobis, Francisco Dutar, Jared Collar, Thomas Wake, and Stephen Acabado, who is the PI for the BAP. So BAP aims to better understand how indigenous groups in the Philippines responded to Spanish colonialism, particularly, of course, in the Beagle region. We know that the Philippines is not a monolith. People have been publishing about this um, topic for a while, but we wanted to give special attention to the Beagle region, to Camarina Sur, to investigate these specific questions. And the BAP was kind of an offshoot of Dr. Acabado's initial project in Ifugao, which asked the same question. How did Ifugao people, how did Ifugaos respond to Spanish colonialism in ways that were different from other Filipinos around the country, especially in Manila, where um, quite a bit of scholarship has been done. But in these other marginal areas, such as Beagle, such as Ifugao, there's not quite as much scholarship asking these very specific questions. And so when the Spanish came to the Philippines in the 16th century, the Archdiocese of Caceres was one of the earliest dioceses established in the archipelago, making Catholicism a major part of local Beagle history. 
And what we want to do is explore how Vigolanos were active agents of change during this period, and not just passive recipients of Spanish influence. For example, a question we can ask is how Bicolanos maintained their identity through the disruption of Spanish colonial missionization, reducción, and other processes that interrupted indigenous lifeways. And to answer this, we look at early Catholic churches in the region since they are known sites of historical significance. We are also interested in how Beagle changed over time, settlement patterns, human environment interactions, not just in the Spanish colonial period, but also looking at the deep history of the region. It's important to be able to compare the before, the after, and the during period of Spanish colonization to see what's changed, what's stayed the same. Survey and excavation, as well as radiocarbon dating and artifact analysis can help us see how both the landscape and the environment changed over the past several hundred years and how humans may have affected this change through things like agriculture, deforestation, settlement patterns, colonialism, and other processes. Through our excavations over the past couple years, we've been able to see some of the material culture that Bicolanos used, including pottery, beads, shellfish, and plant and animal remains. There's still a lot of survey and excavation to come in the next few years as we move throughout the region, as we look at other churches, other sites, um, and we hope to expand our knowledge of Beagle archeology. span now, one of the highlights of working on the Beagle Archaeological Project is the ability to see different facets of archaeology, anthropology, and research intersect, and to see communities with different expertise collaborate. The future of Pico culture and heritage is looking really promising, and I want to reiterate again how excited we are to put out the first publication for BAP in um, Sci Sci, the Journal of Beagle History, especially in the first uh, in the first edition. It's a really, really important thing to publish so that um, the people of Beagle, you know, where this research is happening um, and who this research is affecting, you will have first access to all things Beagle Archaeological Project. So we hope that you enjoy the article. We hope that you learn something about Beagle history, about Beagle archeology, span about Beagle anthropology, and to stay updated and have access to the article, make sure that you're subscribing, that you're there and ready when the article comes out in the end of December. Um, and we'd love to hear your feedback uh, on this amazing collaborative project. Thank you. Dios Mabalos Madi. Joining us today to introduce their articles are two of the Maiden Issues contributors. To tell us more about his article, Racializing Reform, Bishop Francisco Gainza and the Creation of the Native Clergy in the Philippines, 1863 to 1879, May I call on Mr. Jethro A.E.A. A. Kalakday, a doctoral student in history at Trinity College, University of Cambridge. In Bicol historiography, the Spanish Dominican Bishop Francisco Gainza, who was Bishop of Cáceres from 1863 to 1879, is often depicted as the exceptional good friar. Dubbed as pastor and builder, his reputation is that of being a progressive. He advanced the Beagle language by publishing religious literature in the vernacular. He built schools, hospitals, founded a town, and most importantly, revitalized the dwindling seminary of the Diocese of Cáceres. In fact, hagiographies, mostly uncritical, have often painted him to be an unflinching advocate of the native secular clergy. Manuel Artigas y Cuerva, in his early 20th century mammoth of a Philippine history textbook, recounted how Gainza refused the request of the Spanish governor general to defrock Gomez, Burgos, and Zamora before their execution in 1872. My article, however, revisits studies on Gainza, depicting not a resolute Spaniard, but a friar who battled internal conflicts. 
on the one hand to push for church reformation, on the other to pursue colonial logic which has enshrined racism as policy. Hi, I'm Jethro Kalakdai from the University of Cambridge. My essay investigates how Bishop Francisco Gainza grappled with the question of the struggle between the native secular clergy and the Spanish regular clergy. Gainza was initially an advocate for reforms in the Philippine church, especially as they related to the issue of handing over parishes to the secular clergy, or te technically secularization. However, racism complicated the way he personally thought of and it enacted these reforms. I argue that insofar as the question remained within the bounds of ecclesiastical affairs, Gainza rallied against the marginalization of the secular clergy, who by then were predominantly natives. But when the struggle assumed proto-nationalist overtones, he distanced himself from it, thus radically reshaping the way his perceived reforms took effect. Like what m most Spanish clerics thought, native priests in the mind of Gainza must be trained and educated into loyal state workers. All these while Gainza maintained his view that native priests were intrinsically inferior to Europeans. I invite you all to please subscribe to Sai Sai, the Journal of Pico History. Thank you. Jos Mabalos Jethro, we now go to our next contributor to introduce his article Francisco Gainza and the establishment of the Escuela Colegio de Santa Isabel, the pursuit of Hispanization in the Diocese of Cáceres, 1863 to 1877. Let us all welcome once again, Mr. Javier Leonardo Rejeria. In April 2018, the Universidad de Santa Isabel, the sole Vincentian University in the Bicol region, and the first normal school for women in Southeast Asia, commemorated the sesquicentennial year of its foundation. In recognition of this milestone and the university's significance in the history of Philippine education, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, or the NHCP, declared it a National Historical Landmark two months earlier on February 26. Then known as the Escuela Culeo de Santa Isabel de Nueva Cáceres, and now regarded as Bicol's Historical and Heritage University, it was founded by the zealous Dominican missionary Francisco Gainza, who was Bishop of the erstwhile Diocese of Cáceres from 1862 to 1879. Hi, I'm Javier Leonardo V. Rojeria. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of History, University of the Philippines, Diliman. I am the author of the article Francisco Gainza, and the establishment of the Escuela Culeo de Santa Isabel, the pursuit of Hispanization in the Diocese of Cáceres, 1863 to 1877. Despite Santa Isabel's historical and cultural significance, there is a dearth of writings in its history in relation to its founder, Francisco Gainza. The few existing historiography, most of them celebratory and at times hagiographic, generally regard Santa Isabel's establishment as one of Gainza's greatest initiatives and accomplishments during his 17-year episcopacy. They argue that the school forms part of the bishop's ecclesiastical and educational legacy for the Bicolano people. While these accounts underscore Gainza's role as the school's founder, they obscure his rationale for the Culeo's establishment and the larger backdrop of the Spanish Empire that conditioned its possibility. In view of the existing historiography, I ask, why did Gainza establish the Escuela Coleo de Santa Isabel? In addressing this question, I locate Gainza and the establishment of Santa Isabel within the Spanish Empire's efforts to reorganize primary education in the Philippines in the 1860s. I revisit Isabella II's educational decree of December 20, 1863, which forwarded a comprehensive plan of primary instruction in the Philippines. 
Here I discuss the recommendations of José de la Concha to the Queen, which he outlined in the exposition, the rationale of the decree, and its salient provisions. Second, I discuss the significant events leading to the Culeo's creation, inauguration, its eventual elevation into a diocesan normal school in 1875, as well as the significant role Gainza played in its foundation. Finally, I argue that the Culeo's establishment represented the Spanish Empire's wider efforts to reorganize primary education and establish normal schools in the Philippines. It was therefore less of an end in itself than a means to Spain's civilizing mission of Hispanizing the native population. Gainza, an agent of the Spanish Empire by virtue of the Patronato Real, proved to have operated within this colonial discourse. With that, I would like to invite you to read my article in the maiden issue of Saisai, the Journal of Pico History. Madiana sa danay na pakikipag saisai. Dios mabalos po. At this point, friends, we will hear journal reviews and, of course, some hopes for the future of the saisai journal from our international advisory board members. The first one to give her message is Miss Andrea Ragrario, who is an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines, Mindanao. Ms. Aya is also doing her doctorate studies at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Hello to all, um, and it is so great to be here at the invitation of the SciSci Journal team to the virtual launch of the inaugural issue of SciSci, the Journal of Bicol History. Okay, so I'm Andrea Grajo, uh, you can call me Aya, and I'm honored to be one of the members of the Journal's Advisory Board. And just like any honor, uh, this comes to me with a significant sense of responsibility because I personally want to do good by my ancestors on my father's side, no, my Bicolano side. My grandfather was one, Johnny Regragio, um, some of you might have heard of him, who taught English and literature in Ateneo de Naga many decades ago. The important legacy that he left us and to me is this enduring passion for well-wrought words and stories that captivate and resonate. And grow up with stories I did, um, stories of my grandfather's brothers who were in the Bataan Death March and one of whom died in the camps in Capas. Stories of my uncle Clemente Regragio, a civil servant in Albay who was killed during the Marcos dictatorship. Stories of my grandmother's grandfather, Don Manuel de Castro, who built a shipyard and established the town of Magallanes in Sorsogon in the mid 19th century. And so even if I was born and raised in Manila, there were all of these figures and stories that kept me moored to this side of my personal history. And so when Stephen Acabado introduced me to Jai Rujeria and Earl Hernandez, um, the people who are really the ones uh, toiling behind you know, Sai Sai, and they told me about this project and asked if I could be a part of it, I immediately said yes. Listening to how they envisioned the journal and looking at how the Saisai Beagle team maximized all sorts of channels to disseminate and popularize historical knowledge um, on various social media pages, on YouTube, and they even make memes, it was inspiring and fresh and gutsy to be doing all of this in the middle of, of the pandemic. Which may beg the question, is this the best time to be launching a history journal? A journal, after all, isn't a one-off thing like a book. No? It's a long-term commitment because you need successive issues. You need to line up authors. You need to solicit submissions. You need to invite reviewers. And all of that work involved in crafting and then sustaining a journal. But the fact that the Salsaisai journal team was able to assemble a Filipino and international and intergenerational group of editors and editorial advisors really reflect the verve by which they approached this task. That the journal's first issue was released within a year of getting the ball rolling with the reviews, etc., is a demonstration of their determination to get things done. And that's what matters, no? If we ask if this is the best time to be launching a journal, um, we are not just talking about external circumstances and objective conditions. 
but more importantly, how ready we are as active agents to step up and grab the reins of those circumstances and conditions. And I think that that is a crucial les lesson from history uh, that we can all agree to. That said, I wish to invite everyone to support the journal in whatever way possible. Um, of course, subscribing to it will always be welcome. So you can subscribe to it um, as, as a personal subscription. But if you are members of institutions or if you can uh, represent institutions like schools, libraries, um, heritage centers, LGUs, please consider subscribing to it because institutional backing is always so important. Okay, so I have nothing but congratulations and high hopes for SciSci, the Journal of Legal History. After the pandemic, we can only get better. Thank you. Um, and Dios marhay na bagitabi sa gabos. Dios mabalos, Aya. At this juncture, we open the floor for questions. Those joining us on site are invited to approach this microphone uh, for questions, while those joining us online may also type their questions in the comments section. Our SciSci Journal Editorial Board will respond to your questions. Por malta na pong binubuksan ang programa para sa saindong mga hapot. So while uh, waiting because we had an hour of technical rehearsal, I uh, shall I face the audience now? I was able to read the whole article of Jetro Kalakdai, and I really enjoyed a lot the racializing reform. It's not really about a question, but what struck me is in the note that he put. And this is a credit to Jetru, he said in the notes, all error in fact and in interpretation is my entire responsibility. All error in fact and in interpretation is my responsibility. For me, that struck me because that is intellectual honesty that's intellectual integrity when you assume your error in fact and interpretation uh, he said there in the article that he didn't make any value judgment that just just propose historical analysis and i like very much the term paradox i like that more than contradictory the presentation of kainsa his view of reform-minded uh, cleric or bishop and racially-oriented um, Spanish fit into the frame of paradox. Just like a tag of war and a more nuanced presentation of Bishop Gainza. I just have one question to Jetru, if he is around, and to the editorial board, or whether the use, the use of racism, I know he is aware, he said about the critical race theory, is really already a form of value judgment, or is it kind of anachronism or anachronistic when in fact during the time 
Bishop Gainsa may not be conscious or uh, knowledgeable about racism. So only my question is whether it's just an attitude of superiority because he is a Spaniard and he is not native, he would naturally and logically favor the Spanish viewpoint, which is one valid, which is a valid viewpoint, given the fact that he is limited by his own historicity and his own context. My question to Jethro is whether it is a little bit too much to use the term racism or racially inclination when uh, um, Bishop Gainza was able also to form a, the first Bicolano bishop and the first Filipino bishop in Asia in the person of Bishop Jorge Barlin, which is also the pride of the Bicolanos in Asia. So he was the protege of Gainza. Now, my question is, that's my question. I hope it will reach him. Thank you. I think the, the question is addressed to the author, so I could not speak in behalf of the author. So what, uh, th the best that we can do is so bring the question to him, and probably after a day or two, you'll get your reply. But I think um, that's a valid question. If you have any other uh, questions, okay, Jai, <laughs> those who are present here, or as... Um, Regarding the journal, uh, you are very much welcome. Thank you very much. Yes, so if you have more questions, those joining us online are also invited to email their questions in the comment section. And our technical team will take note of them and we'll read them aloud in the on site. Okay. So I would like to thank everyone yeah, who joined sense. us. Uh, we have a list supposedly, but we thank everyone who joined us in our lunch on site uh, here at the St. Jude um, Tadeus Parish in our Friendly Churchyard. Um, yeah, so if you have more questions, go we can uh, just do this. All right. So we'll, while waiting for questions, no, we'd like to um, recognize no, the presence of our guests from various uh, educational institutions, from the Ateneo de Naga University, from the CBSUA, um, from Universidad de Santa Isabel, from uh, Partido State University, from Naga College Foundation, from the Department of Education, Concepcion Pequeña High School, from the Bicol University, from CBSUA, Pili Campus, from Calabanga Community College, and from the Universidad de Santa Isabel Graduate School. Um, right, so, so if we have more questions, Please uh, feel free to just raise your hand, perhaps, or in the chat, uh, in the comment section, please type them in. All right. All right, Father Philip, I received a reply from Jethro. He says, 
my article challenges precisely that notion that racism is merely historical context and makes us look at the inherent paradox in the case of Gainza. For further clarification, please see the paragraph where I treat this critique. The paragraph on Willie Jennings, though. My clarification, the paragraph on Willie Jennings. Thank you, Father. Thank you, uh, Sir Jethro, uh, Sir Jai, for reading the response. All right. And okay, so at this point, uh, we also have representatives uh, present on site from um, GMA Seven and. Uh, Be Call Idol FM. So if we have questions, dear friends, please uh, feel free to raise them. Dako lang pasasalamat po sa gabos na nagtaram as nagpaabot kan sa indang mensahe ngunya na aldaw. Once again, we are proud to present to you Sai Sai, the Journal of Bicol History. We'd like to inform everyone that we are now accepting orders. For those interested, you may fill out the subscription form which you can find in the caption of our live stream. Please note that the subscription rates indicated in the form do not include shipping. Subscription rates, excluding shipping fees, um, are as follows. Institutional, 450 pesos per issue. Individual, 395 pesos. Inimbitaran mi po ng God ang gabos na makisumaro sa Samuya, sa Saisay Bicol, na urog tapang pagyamanon ang satuyang pag-aram. Pagsabot, pag-eksperyensya, kansatuyang kasaysayan. Kasaysayan na nagpapatalingkas, kasaysayan na nagtataong liwanag, tanganing ang buhay tangunyan, urug pang magin pagkanigoon. For correspondences with Saysay Bicol and for inquiries on orders of Saysay, the Journal of Bicol History, please you may contact Sai Sai Bicol, care of the Archdiocesan Shrine and Parish of St. Jude Thaddeus, Concepcion Grande, Naga City, 4400 Philippines, with mobile number 0916-239-8306 and email address saisaijournal at gmail.com. Liwat, ako po si Val Dominic Monit, Nagpapa Diyos Mabalos sa saindong pakisumaro sa Samuya sa pagbungsod na ini. On behalf of the Saisai Bicol, I would like to thank everyone again for coming and for joining us this afternoon. Para sa urog kararong pang pagsaysay, ako po giraray si Christiano Mikael M. Bate, now signing off, Diyos Mabalos po. Yeah. Just mabalos po. Uh, at uh, after our program, there are, there's a refreshment bar at the back. So please um, take your refreshments. And outside, at the hallway, at the registration table, we have copies of the journal. You can buy a copy po at the hallway. Maraming salamat po, Just mabalos, for joining us this afternoon. <laughs>